ओके प्रमोद ये स्क्रीन पे दोनों को डालिए yes, दोनों को फोकस करिए ओके क्योंकि वो नीचे जाता है ना इसलिए तो जा कर सकते ओके नाउ वी आर ऑलमोस्ट लाइव एंड प्रमोद कैन वी स्टार्ट नाउ यस सर यू कैन स्टार्ट नाउ ओके uh yeah i can see uh, uh, we have been highlighted general uh, okay i welcome everybody to a e vyakhyan mala session on disruptive technologies and to talk to you on this very important subject today we have with us lieutenant general pj spanno pvsm avsm vsm uh, he is not he was not only a lieutenant general but what is more important to me that he was also the colonel of the maratha light infantry a regiment from where i come and he has a very distinguished career uh, and a very illustrious career i'll talk about it shortly uh, before i uh, before that i'll introduce the topic to you the topic today in front of us is evolving disruptive technologies and we'll be interviewing general pannu who was a person in the army dealing with the exactly this subject we are going to have our interview in three parts today we will talk till about 11:55 and take few questions also the next session will be on thursday 7:30 to 7:55 in the evening and the third and the final session will be on uh, next sunday uh, today we are going to talk about disruptive technologies but in non contact and non kinetic environment uh, what is disruptive technologies sometime back i got a call from army war college in mahu they said ki sir we have heard that you write about uh, these kind of things so can you talk uh, and what do you think is the biggest disruptive technology today that we have i said yes i know there is a virus called the chinese virus some people call it corona some people call it covid 19 but this is the biggest disruptive technology the human kind is ever seen do you want me to speak on that he said no 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 so no no we don't this is not what we are expecting from you uh, when we talk of disruptive technologies we mean artificial intelligence we mean robotics we mean nanotechnology we mean hypersonic weapons we mean quantum technology i said okay i am an infantry officer uh, well i have heard of these things and i do talk about it once in a while but i am not a person to talk about it so therefore i was not taken in the panel uh, of that uh, seminar that they had for three days uh, on disruptive technologies but today we have a very very qualified person to talk on this issue uh, and i am personally thankful to general pannu for having uh, accepted the invitation straight away i spoke to him i said do we talk on it he said yes and that's it uh, people should realize that today uh, till just few days back or few months back he was heading the very Uh, 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 this particular subject in the Indian Army. I what I'll do now is I'll introduce you uh, very briefly his illustrious career. He's got so many achievements that to talk about him in next two minutes is going to be difficult. But I'll highlight certain things because most of this uh, brief uh, bio data of his has been put on the Facebook, and I'm sure you have gone through it. He has a very uh, uh, impressive and uh, illustrious career in the armed forces. Uh, spread over nearly four decades and mind you he is a second generation officer uh, what is uh, 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 out of his complete uh, bio data what is of importance to me personally is that he commanded 22 maratha light infantry uh, and i have a lot of connection with 22 maratha light infantry because when i did my bios when i was in the regimental center my roommate was colonel sn upadhyay uh, who happened to be from 22 maratha so i started knowing about it Uh, right since those days and some other lighter moments i will mention to you a bit later uh, he commanded a brigade on the loc he commanded a division uh, on the chinese front and most important he commanded a very uh, 14 core in ladakh which was the scene of action all this while and here i must uh, 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 just go slightly off the subject and i must tell you that during the peak of ladakh crisis 
the 14th Corps was commanded by a Maratha light infantry officer, Lieutenant General Harinder Singh, and I must talk, up, uh, talk about his name very, very proudly. Uh, General Pannu thereafter has done a lot of things. Uh, he was the one who raised the Defense Space Agency. He's raised the Defense Cyber Agency. He was also headed the Special Forces Division. So I'm really tempted to talk, of, uh, talk on all these issues because while a lot of people know about surgical strike in Kashmir, what the army did, people know about uh, the surgical strike which was done at Balakot, but the one that was done in Myanmar, and incidentally, I've spoken on, on this subject, Operation Sunrise, if I remember the name correctly, some time back from the very forum, but if there is a time later, we can talk about these issues also. But today, we'll entirely focus on the technological issues and uh, to talk to us uh, about it is uh, General Pannu will tell us all about it. And what I would like to mention uh, before I stop his introduction is that he's developing a concept called Military 4.5 which requires the defense forces to guide the industry so that we leapfrog as far as defense technology is concerned. I must add here that he has a number of decorations to his credit, Param Vishishta Seva Medal, Ati Vishishta Seva Medal, Vishishta Seva Medal, and not to mention that he's also been awarded Chief of Army Staff's Commendation Card. I'll very briefly come about the subject Actually, it is customary that when you get a person uh, to Savarkar Smarak to talk on any issue, we always present these people with a, uh, a book which was written uh, on uh, Swatantrivi Savarkar. This book cannot be shown to him, uh, can, cannot be given to him now because it's a, uh, uh, this physical thing cannot be done. Uh, but I must tell you virtually, this is a book that we would have presented to him and the book has been dispatched to him. Hopefully, it will reach him in a short while. I'll very quickly cover the topic, uh, introduce you to uh, the uh, uh, to all the disruptive technologies, and then I'll request the general to cover the subject. Today, we are fighting a multi-domain war against China in Ladakh. We have cyber attacks. We have Chinese steal, uh, stealing our intelligence. There were a lot of disruptive things which they used, and no less a person than Chief of Defense Staff, General Rawat mentioned that by using few disruptive technologies, Chinese thought that they could scare the Indian army. Of a late, there was a, a fire which took place in the Serum Institute, which manufactures vaccine. Was it a fire or was it a sabotage? There was a, a avalanche which came down in the month of February in Uttarakhand. There was a talk that possibly a disruptive technology like direct energy weapons may have been used. There was a attack on the electricity grid of Maharashtra in Mumbai. And for 12 hours, Mumbai was in dark. Uh, was that a cyber attack by Chinese? Well, it was, but uh, it was not given too much of publicity. So these all are all are disruptive technologies which are there. Disruptive technologies has positive uses. It has negative uses. Why is this subject important to general public is, if you can utilize the positive uses, then we can become much better country at governing ourselves and reap the benefits of disruptive technology. Negative uses, of course, are uh, really have to be avoided, but we will talk about it when General Pannu touches the subject. So very briefly now, I will, uh, I mean, I'll end in the next one or two minutes. If you look at Indian Armed Forces capability to, uh, let's say, accept technology, uh, our performance in developing uh, disruptive military technologies over three decades has been quite unsatisfactory. We have had a number of agencies, uh, a number of uh, reports, exp expert reports, and I can mention some of them. There was a report prepared by group of ministers in 2001. Uh, there was a report of Kelkar Committee. There was a report of Sisodia Committee. There was a report of Ramarao Committee. All of them talked about technology, how it should be inducted, but uh, what we did was a very little uh, was implemented out of it. It is not to say that we did not implement it, but uh, the implementation was not up to the mark. So what uh, what does the future hold as far as disruptive technology uh, is concerned? To tell you about it, I will invite now uh, General uh, General Pannu to talk on uh, talk on this very important issue. But what I would like to tell you just once is that there are two approaches. Uh, as far as, uh, uh, let's say, 
uh, introducing disruptive technologies in the armed forces and at a national level. One is chalta hai approach. Kya ha, yes, we are doing something about it. And second is leapfrogging approach or accepting it so fast uh, that we are able to start reaping the benefit in the very near future. So to talk to us on all these issues related to national uh, issues uh, of disruptive technologies, uh, we have General Pannu with us today. And I invite the General to share his thoughts on this very important subject. Over to General PJS Pannu. Uh, thank you, Brigadier Mahajan, uh, and I must thank uh, uh, the uh, Sar uh, Varkar Samarak also, you know, to have uh, invited me to speak at this very respected platform. Uh, it is a very relevant issue that when we talk about China, we know that last year, largely the whole world spent struggling uh, from the disease, which is COVID. And it is not only the COVID as a disease, I think it spread in a manner that there was a lot of controversy around it. And controversy is, of course, something that we can talk about a little later. But what China also did, it militarily attacked a number of places. And for us, it is relevant that it actually brought in forces very rapidly into Eastern Ladakh and went and captured certain areas north of Pagongso and came into areas of uh, Gogra, Hot Spring, uh, Debsang. Uh, and as a result, Indian Army very quickly reacted to it and occupied some very relevant heights uh, south of Pegong. So, and that is when the entire uh, military to military, eyeball to eyeball contact established some kind of a checkmated uh, uh, you know, uh, scenario. Uh, and this year, uh, very quickly, Chinese pulled out after the ninth co commanders meet. Uh, so, what we are talking about today is not force on force or eyeball to eyeball or military to military. Uh, contact warfare. We are talking about something which is beyond contact warfare for the simple reason that when people were speculating whether we are going to war or not, or whether we have al already been fighting a war with the Chinese, it is easy for people who've understood the conventional warfare that two forces fight physically. But last year, what happened, other than Galwan and few skirmishes near the Blacktop Hill, uh, there was no way that both forces started to fire at each other. No firearms were used. As a result, we started talking about technologies which the Chinese have used, are using, possibly, and have been using, and are likely to use to win a war. As Sun Tzu says, that it is important to win a war without fighting. Now, is that what the Chinese is doing? That they bring the forces, not fight physically, but they would still want to win a war? We need to understand the DNA of the Chinese. Now, today, China has come to a stature of their own, their own reckoning to say we have arrived. China does not want itself to be referred to as a regional power or even, even a growing power. They have arrived. And how they have arrived at this uh, stature is that their technological power has emerged as the most relevant contributor to the comprehensive national power. Earlier, when we calculated the comprehensive national power, we could never ever imagine that very quickly it is going to be the technological power, which is going to be the major driving force. And how the technological power can be seen is few indications are that you study the uh, uh, innovative index uh, of a country, you study the HRD index of a country, and you study the industrial index of a country, when you sum total it, it will give you the total R&D index, the research and development power. Uh, as a result, when uh, Brigadier Mahajan was talking about the military 4.5, with technologies which are coming up, when I realized that there is a deficiency in our way of looking at how, how much technology we have actually inducted into our armed forces, I stumbled upon three uh, things in the military four point, and I talk about power, I talk about materials, and I talk about electronics. If a country has not invested in these three, you are unlikely to succeed in major contribution to, towards being a technological power. Uh, if you look at China, you know, the batteries come from there, that is power. The rare earth materials come from there. 60% of the earth, uh, rare earth uh, materials are with China. And when you talk about electronics, you look at 
how much they have invested in the research and development. All the chips and large amount of chips are actually coming from China. So if the PME, which is the prime driver of technological power, is with China, then what do you expect? How would they do R&D? Because even their innovative index is high, their human resource index is high, their industrial complex, making it a very high industrial index, uh, gives them an opportunity to, for R&D. And with PME put together, well, they are right on the top and actually challenging, challenging the Americans. Uh, Americans are very worried about it. The US has, uh, for many, many decades now, remained as the sole power dictating the future of the globe. But Chinese have last year actually come out and have openly started threatening the world, economically, trade-wise, uh, militarily. And what is happening is now that they have used a strategy. In the strategy, they have actually set the house of their adversaries on fire. And in their own strategy, say, you must loot a burning house. How do you loot a burning house? You must burn the adversary's house first. You see there is disruption all over. Uh, countries are actually coping up their own economic struggle because of the COVID disruption which came in. As a result, the house is on fire of major adversaries of China. It is very, you know, in a, in a very insidious manner, uh, helping the adversaries of their adversaries and it means creating friends through which the technology is being supplied to become a greater multiplier of disruption. So when you talk about warfare, warfare is not about shooting bullets at each other or shooting guns or missiles at each other. I think largely this is what the disrupt disruptive technologies would do. And I suppose, uh, uh, Brigadier Mahajan, uh, I, I would finish here to introduce how the Chinese would fight the warfare that is fighting uh, uh, war and winning it without actually fighting it. So fighting differently through technology. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thanks a lot for your opening remarks. And uh, what I want to tell you uh, today is, you know, uh, when this Ladakh crisis was at, at its peak, uh, you know, basically, if you see, uh, there was a, what is called as, they use certain t uh, terms, like they talked about, I wonder uh, if you can hear me properly. I can hear you. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, when the Ladakh crisis was at its peak, you know, there were certain terms that they used. They said, we have drones which will provide uh, uh, hot food or warm food to the soldiers deployed on the front. Then they talked about uh, direct energy weapons. They say troops, uh, Indian troops deployed at uh, Pangangso Lake and Galwan Valley. They'll be attacked with direct. Uh, they'll be used. Uh, they will use microwave or oven weapons against them. Though of course uh, that uh, capability they don't have. Uh, then they talked about uh, super soldiers. You know they say uh, we have creating super soldiers who can carry twice the amount of weight than what your soldiers can carry. Uh, but they ha we have given them some kind of gadgetries uh, by which uh, you know they will perform much better. But that was not how it actually turned out on the ground. Uh, it was the Indian soldiers' his capability to fight a good leadership, uh, uh, those old world uh, 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 you know, war tactics, uh, actually uh, won us the day as far as the Ladakh standoff was concerned. So what I would request you is, what kind, uh, how much of this uh, kind of a technology uh, were the Chinese able to use? Because they claim a lot of things, but uh, what they have actually been able to use is a very little of it. So can you tell us as to what advances the Chinese have made in these kind of fields and how much of it have they used somewhere or the other? Because they talk a lot, there's a lot of psychological warfare, there's a lot of propaganda warfare, but what we find is uh, that uh, they are not been able to use the kind of a technology they claim to have in actual warfare. Though of course they have done a wonderful job as far as cyber attacks are concerned, They've done a wonderful uh, job as far as uh, you know disrupting you via stealing your big data is concerned. But militarily, how much of it uh, uh, could uh, could they use? Uh, please tell us about that, and then you can talk about the other non-contact means that they used. Over to uh, General Pannu. Uh, thank you, Brigadier Mahajan. I think uh, the war is not over. I think uh, the game is still in the play. 
uh, it won't be proper to say that you know the end game has happened. The end game has not happened, and we actually cannot see the end to it yet. Because when I said that the actual competition that the Chinese have is to cross America before uh, 2050, uh, they use such disruptions like COVID to disturb the world and go ahead by you know, uh, re-energizing the calendar of speed. And they want to actually beat their own uh, ambitions. And therefore, they would want to weaken their adversaries and go ahead of them. Um, I will just talk about, uh, you know, when they came in contact with our troops over a period of time, you saw certain better technologies that they had. You know, for reconnaissance, very close to the troops, they had better all-terrain vehicles and articulated all-terrain terrain vehicles. It means they are track, double track, and then they're pushing and pulling yeah, each other. So, so therefore, their movement in the mountains was heavily supported by technology. Uh, this is to keep the troops fit and less fatigued. They were all having communications which are ubiquitous and real time, completely secure and satellite based. And they had actually invested a lot in rapid acclimatization, forward medical facilities, speedy evacuation, and better clothing. They also invested a huge amount of money in creating a, a digital wall all along the frontier. I, I'm calling it a frontier because you know you can't call it a border, you can't call it a LAC, you know, it is mix of all. So all along the frontier. They have got a digital wall, uh, which gives them ground information. And they have also got 24 seven informatization activities where it is completely digital that they get a three dimensional view, including the satellite pictures and ground pictures and all the other you know, cyber warfare and other things that I'm going to talk about. So as a result, when they have not actually gone to war, they brought in this equipment, they use this equipment equipment to prove that the sustainability is good as far as the technology is concerned. We have not spoken about human to human, and I think uh, that that is not even a comparison, neither it is a, a subject of uh, today's debate. But when you're talking about the overall non-kinetic non-contact, we must be aware that the space is a domain which China has invested very heavily. Uh, which is giving them a good surveillance. You know, they have got China high resolution earth observation system. And they are developing this in a manner that they would always keep the Indian landscape, not only Indian landscape, but all the uh, in areas and, under interest in constant watch. Uh, they have actually gone in for investment, which is 300 times larger than field of view from the satellite you know, which is even larger than the US uh, Hubble Space Telescope. They have invested in that kind of a thing. So the surveillance is real time. Uh, it is giving them very high re resolution pictures. They can actually make out what infrastructure we are making, where the military is moving, whatever is happening in the hinterland, how the logistics are coming up, and how the whole assessment then gets converted into good analytics. And this analytics are also down to the tactical battlefield area analytics. Uh, as a result, it is not that the Chinese language, it is the ent entire computer gives them a ready-made situational upgrade right up to the analytics available at the hands of uh, commanders on ground. Similarly, when you talk about surveillance, uh, they have invested hugely into geospatial data and monitoring movements and locations, uh, as, as I told you. And also, they have invested in human, human and human of theirs is something which is completely, completely invisible. They've been able to hide it very well through the missions and through the trade that they do. Because in a number of companies which operate all over the world, number of students who are moving around all over the world are, are giving them human, uh, their industry and the business partners, you know, a number of apps which are, uh, you know, being uh, uh, sold in these uh, countries are huge. So the Chinese footprint is not only on the borders of behind the borders or in space and cyber, but also in human. Similarly, when you talk about uh, uh, their artificially generated natural acts, they have invested hugely in uh, uh, changing the weather conditions, uh, in changing the biological uh, and the radiological uh, you know, use of agents. Um, they have actually triggered floods, rains, clouds, uh, and fog through a combination of electronic emissions and chemicals. Uh, so therefore, all that if it is put together, 
you will realize that their adversaries are all the time kept under surveillance and constant disruption and they would cover the the natural calamity and camouflage it under the acts of god and once you cover that under the acts of god the adversary is in any case weakened so you know i will again keep reminding of sunzu you win a war without fighting one so therefore all these things put together bring them to huge amount of deception huge amount of cyber surveillance intelligence cyber data manipulation and deterrence to to bring the south sites down say for example you know you gave Uh, an example of uh, all electricity infrastructure crumbling in bombay there was a blackout so they have actually got the entire critical infrastructure which is based on the cyber and also the use of all three dimensions the internet the deep web and the dark web they use all three dimensions their 5g technology and their electronic uh, market has made them actually set in every possible place where there is anything to do with computer and so so they are all there they are all pervasive and i have not yet spoken about certain things but at the moment i will just leave it at that and would want your interjection and then cover certain more areas after this uh yes uh, uh, general pandu you have covered this uh, the their capabilities to use technology for surveillance for movement etc very very well i would uh, want you to uh, tell me about two things as to uh, what is indian capability in this field i am sure it is going to improve because you are in charge of uh, defense cyber agency defense uh, space agency etc uh, that is one aspect and secondly uh, the, uh, you talked about uh, the chinese intelligence unfortunately in our uh, in the indian scenario even a school boy knows about pakistani intelligence or pakistan's intelligence agency isi you just utter word isi people will give you a talk for next one hour as to what they are doing bleeding india by thousand cuts etc but chinese intelligence very little is known about it and you very rightly said that uh, every chinese to a china a china man today is a first uh, 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 let's say a, an intelligence gathering person be it student be it people in the uh, let's say uh, in the corporate world uh, people who are a tourist and all kinds of techniques they use including softwares including hardwares including apps to collect data from all over and of course recently uh, since last few months government has banned all the chinese apps we are trying to uh, come out of the chinese clutches as far as technology is concerned because anything and everything which has a chinese connection there is always a fear that data will get leaked and they have such a huge capacity for computing and analyzing data that they will they can possibly find out Uh, no will know you better than what we know us you know so what i would like you to tell me now is uh, uh, yes chinese are ahead there is no doubt on this issue uh, but uh, while china technologically is ahead but it is the indian soldiers by virtue of their human element of war their leadership their physical fitness their toughness their mental capability not to get uh, bogged down by the kind of a propaganda warfare that the chinese launched Uh, through our media through their social media etc we still manage to hold our own and that credit is of course to the soldiers officers leading from the front the commanders on the spot right from a brigade commander to a corps commander even to an army commander and of course the chief those are the pluses the human angle of ours is definitely was much better and and it was proved in that manner uh, that uh, the chinese soldiers were not willing to serve on the front while they had a lot of uh, issues you know all of them uh, they come there for only 3 years one and uh, uh, they are always looking backwards because uh, you know most of them want to go back and start their career in somewhere else so th- that will be a longish topic i will not talk about it right now but what i will request you now is that in this non kinetic non contact things uh, what is the kind of a progress uh, that we are making and what do you think is going to happen Uh, say in the near future of one to five years, and maybe even after that. Uh, over to you, General Pandu. Uh, thank you, Brigadier Mahajan. Since it is an open domain, uh, I would uh, not want to really talk about certain things. But let me assure you that, as far as uh, Indian Defence Forces are concerned, uh, we timely raise the space and the space. Uh, our DRDO and ISRO uh, put 
together actually that, you know, as far as ASAT is concerned, in 2019, actually we broke a satellite, you know, in the counter space technology demonstration uh, in Mission Shakti. Uh, also, as far as our other satellites are concerned, I think our space industry uh, has now got a huge uh, fillip uh, from the ISRO that their uh, labs are being opened up for startups to use and collaborate and go into business. But I think there's a lot of work in progress because the race is rapid and fast. And I think we need to catch up hugely uh, in these technologies. Uh, so I would again uh, draw your attention to the power materials and electronics. I think that is where our industry needs to invest. And when I talk about military 4.5, I actually uh, talk about military leading the industry because industry sometimes gets, gets wavered. They have no idea what the military wants. And if uh, military also doesn't know the capability and the capacities of our own uh, industrial base, then there is a problem in actually collaborating. So therefore, 4.5 is actually taking the industry beyond the industrial age, that is the info age of uh, 4.0. Um, when I talk about Chinese, you know, Chinese actually another they have encryption quantum uh, computer, quantum uh, physics, uh, or increasingly, uh, is going to be protected by the uh, quantum technology. Uh, their encryption is going to be much faster. Uh, so therefore, it will be difficult to break their codes. And they will use the same technology to break our codes, which is going to be done much more easily. So, so as a result, uh, we are quite mindful of it uh, to make sure that we continue to protect ourselves so what I would say is that our cyber and space would hugely invest in defending ourselves first before we go in for disruptive technology, which are more deterrent in nature. I think with the, with the Chinese, it is not only uh, that, that you create some kind of a deterrence, uh, you know, which is uh, dissuasive, but I think you have to go for a credible deterrence. And therefore we have to also ramp up our AI capabilities uh, in our electronics and uh, machine to machine learning. I think that is where we need to invest. And I think hugely, they are much into information warfare. Uh, information warfare really uh, is, a, is a great game when I talk about 5G, because 5G is not only giving you service, but also completely controlling you. If uh, 5G uh, technology of the Chinese like uh, was almost there, you know, in our country to be, to be taken in, uh, they would have completely had the, not only the information, but also control of most of our machines. Uh, so therefore, uh, using that, they can use the information warfare for targeting the minds of soldiers and people, which we have to be very, every media post must be seen if it is demoralizing the Indian uh, soldiers and Indian citizens, you should know that there is something and we, we need to uh, secure ourselves that not to go into keep forwarding something which is uh, you know disrupting your own minds because disrupting technology is disrupting the minds and they will completely upset the morale of uh, uh, our indian uh, troops and also citizens because you see what is happening is when you fight a war you're fighting one on the borders uh, that is on the northern front and it can also be two front if you invest in and uh, you know encourage the adversaries by giving them technology and uh, military power but I think largely the hinterland needs to be protected. That is the population of India. And that is where information warfare and cyber and the space where all the time you are being under watch. So this great game is something I think we need to understand and play accordingly. Similarly, the third dimension is, as I said, first borders and then hinterland is the international arena. Because if you're making friends with somebody else, they would want to cause disruption in there. Uh, you know, coming together, uh, into technology so that we don't collaborate in technology. So I think that is what has also been understood when you collaborate with others. More so when you are talking about non-contact and non-kinetic, it is not about military, which does maneuver. Uh, the strategy is both in maneuver and also in mind. So therefore, both these can also be controlled by technology. Um, so, so therefore, the strategy is an application. And there is no technology which would be successful unless it is accompanied by strategy. And I think the Chinese are, are quite successful to maneuver around in the world. But I think with COVID, 
uh, the way the whole world has got damaged, I think Chinese have been caught. And I think the whole world is looking at their disruption, which they, they are causing through all the biological, radiological, the industrial complex and the military complex. And I think we need to watch the non-kinetic, non-contact aspects, because more often than not, we keep looking at kinetic and contact aspects. So therefore, I think we chose the right topic that let's not talk about the kinetic and contact, because that is where people keep looking at. But I think what, what is more damaging and what is more disturbing is when you look at the non-contact and non-kinetic. Uh, I'll offer about two comments and then I'll request you again comments from you. Uh, non-kinetic, non-contact, uh, information warfare, psychological warfare, propaganda warfare, disinformation warfare. Uh, these are all our country cousins and uh, related to each other. And they launched a propaganda uh, biz uh, when this Ladakh problem started off, you know, and uh, it was Indian media which fell into their trap. You, you would remember that there was a, uh, I mean, you, I'm sure at that point of time, you must have gone on TV a number of times and must have spoken to a lot of TV media, a lot of uh, print media. But there was a headline, Ki Chinese tanks there at uh, so-and-so place. But they asked me, I said, Ki, you think our tanks are now resting at Ahmednagar? Oh, Chinese guns have reached at so-and-so place. Are, are our guns uh, today resting at Dewali or Nashik Road? China, uh, 50,000 soldiers. You think our soldiers are having a good time in Pune or something? So unfortunately, uh, they, uh, there were uh, three or four targets they were trying to target in this information war of theirs, you know. One is the leadership of the country, second are the armed forces, third is the common people. So leadership wasn't affected too much. The, uh, uh, a common soldier or the armed forces were able to overcome this effect of information warfare in a good manner. But some section of the society were definitely worried and some well-meaning people Ki, oh my God, Chinese are concentrated. What do you do? Chinese are come to next to Pangangso Lake. What do they do? And uh, terms like finger three, finger four became, uh, uh, you know, people started talking about it as if it's, a, it's some lane in Pune, you know, where you go daily and there are experts are talking on finger four and all. So information warfare, uh, as you're right, uh, soldiers is one aspect, but a common citizen today is almost a soldier in this information warfare. And you have rightly said that you should forward nothing which has got an anti-India bias or trying to overstate something, trying to, uh, you know, sow a seed of doubt in your mind that our armed forces are not capable. We have to give a message to everybody, which is what you try to do, that Indian armed forces are more than capable of meeting the military challenge. There is no doubt on that, the kinetic aspects. But the non-military challenge or the non-kinetic aspect is an issue on which we still have to work upon. And you talked about uh, how the mind can be changed. There's a word, the, uh, there's a term used these days called hacking the mind. You know, you can hack into a mind of somebody. And the best example that I can give you from the history is, uh, I think it, uh, one decade or two decade back, there was a person called Gorbachev. He was uh, the leader of the United States Soviet uh, Republic. And suddenly his mind was struck up, uh, perestroika, glasnost. And what happened uh, thereafter? that a mighty USSR broke into so many countries, Russia and many others. So this was one great example of a leader being targeted, whether it was done by the Americans, whether it was done by anybody else, uh, only uh, Gorbachev can tell you. Uh, but these kind of programs are even now going on. In fact, there was a friend of mine, a friend of mine, uh, um, mine who was based in USA. He claimed to be a, a, a part of a team that targeted uh, uh, Gorbachev's mind. I don't know whether he's overstating it or not, but the fact is, USSR broke. And fact is, it was it shouldn't have broken, uh, but it broke because the leader at that point of time thought that the country had no future. And something similar, uh, I don't want to uh, uh, sort of highlight it too much, happened to us in 1962, when we lost the battle uh, of 62 in the minds of the leadership, while not even... 90% uh, of the Indian Army had not been utilized and 100% of Air Force and 100% of Navy had not been utilized, but the, mind, uh, the battle was lost in the minds of people. So we have had a, a very uh, good session in which you talked about uh, non kinetic and non-contacting. Now, what I will request you is kindly give your concluding remarks uh, on this aspect. Uh, and uh, of course, I must tell you that we are happy to uh, uh, learn from you that while we cannot talk about our own capabilities in an open domain for obvious reasons, but about the enemy, we can talk about it in, a, uh, in the open domain, uh, definitely. 
Uh, so kindly tell us, uh, give your concluding remarks on uh, this non-kinetic, non-contract warfare and tell us uh, what you think we'll be able to uh, achieve, uh, say, in a short-term future of, of five years and a long-term future thereafter. Over to you, Jangu. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Brigadier Marjan. I think our country is blessed that we face challenges. If we had not faced challenges, we would not know uh, how to you know, shape our future as you talk about next five, 10 years. Uh, we are also lucky that we have a global power now, which is right in our neighborhood. And it is challenging, challenging us directly. So, you know, you don't have to play a match with a 10th or the, you know, fifth team in the world. You're almost playing an uh, even match uh, uh, with the, a power which claims itself to be risen. Uh, it is going to continue to challenge us. So therefore, we have to make sure that we invest in our military, in our internal strengths, and also in our comprehensive national power in a manner that we are actually competing in the top three. And if we don't, then it means we would have run out of time and we are going to be on the wrong side of the history. And I think enough investment and enough mind is being spent by the Indian um, you know, intelligentsia and our think tanks and, and the government uh, in that regard. Uh, as far as the information warfare, psychological war warfare, or you know, hacking the minds of people is concerned, well, there is always uh, in warfare, uh, you know, uh, psychological warfare actually is meant at four planes. One is that you must make your own leader happy and self-confident about the decisions. You know, the Xi Jinping is taking so. So therefore, a lot of news was being fed to their own leader that his morale should be high when the whole world was actually booing at him for bringing on the COVID crisis. And also, it was very important for the PLA to send some good news to their own leader so that the morale doesn't go down. And secondly, their own people, because when every uh, you know, country in the world was talking against China, obviously the morale of the people and their own uh, PLA would go down. I think a lot of news was being fed for their own. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, their, uh, their friends, that is our uh, adversaries, you know, they have made certain friends, you know, like Pakistan and all that. I mean, imagine if the news of defeat of China or, you know, difficulty of the Chinese troops uh, is fed to Pakistan, how would they feel? They would feel miserable uh, about, you know, being allied to a wrong partner. So, you know, uh, that is how psychological warfare is not only aimed against the adversary, but when it is aimed at the adversary, it is also to demoralize the leadership of that country, the demoralize the, lead, uh, the people of that country, and demoralize the allies uh, or, or friends of that country. I think these are the themes uh, which are written down, and that is how the psychological warfare agendas uh, are, are prepared, and there are experts uh, who write these scripts. But having said that, there has to be some amount of credibility. If there is nothing and you make mountain out of it, very soon the psychological warfare also, you know, campaign uh, disappears. So therefore, something has to be there for a successful psych psychological warfare or hacking of the mind is concerned. You know, if, if it doesn't smell, if it doesn't sound, so you cannot say that somebody burst a cracker next to you. It must smell and sound of a cracker. Only then you would know that there is something. Well, then you can keep building cracker to a bomb. Uh, you know, well, that is that is the gap. And that is how the statecraft is also built in what you tell your own people and when you tell the outside world. That is the difference between the two. You tell different stories to these. And I suppose as far as technology is concerned and as far as strategy is concerned, I think we need to invest in both heavily, which we are doing. And I think our nation, uh, as I said, would take these, uh, you know, um, uh, challenges as opportunities. And I think uh, opportunity is there. And I think in the next five to 10 years, uh, we would come out, uh, you know, with flying colors because it is going to be a necessity to survive and necessity to win. Uh, those were very reassuring words. Uh, and uh, I was looking at the chat box. There are a lot of questions that have come up, but I'll take only one or two of them. Uh, and uh, I will uh, just some, I mean, uh, combine all these questions uh, so that uh, you know we don't overshoot the time too much. Uh, there was a book written some time back uh, called "The Amazing Race Between the Chinese Hare and the Indian Tortoise." Amazing race between the Chinese Hare and the Indian Tortoise. 
all of us have read isap niti uh, and we know that uh, it was the tortoise which won the race because the tortoise was dhayavadi he did not fall or uh, pray to temptations uh, which came in the route while the hare was over confident uh, and uh, he uh, stopped at many places uh, looked at the beauties around and uh, the race was won by a tortoise so let us hope uh, that the indian tortoise gets uh, uh, turned into a hare and wins the race but there's one thing i would like to uh, uh, ask you a, a question about that today if you look at world's best technological institutions i repeat world's best technological institutions like nasa national aeronautics space administration uh, we all know that 30% of the scientists are indians today you take fortune 500 companies like google and microsoft and all the ceos are indians the ceos are indians and today you take uh, let's say Uh, uh, the uh, the strongest country in the world and its vice president uh, Kamala Harris has Indian roots. So please tell me, the Indians perform so well uh, when they go outside India, but inside India they start asking for things uh, which government can't give you. Everybody wants something. I want this. I want that. I want that. Economic appeasement and uh, nobody is willing to tell uh, as to what he will do for the country. He only wants something from the country. You know. but when they go outside they put their heads down and put on hard work and rise to the top in their careers so my question to you after this longish thing is are we trying to get such bright minds in america or in europe who are already working on technology like artificial intelligence etc and get them to us get them into drdo get them in the isro so that instead of crawling we leave frog into the world of disruptive technologies Uh, uh over to you general pandu i uh, i think the direction of wind is very important to know when the brain drain happens it happens from one place to another and we must mark how the brain drain has happened in our country uh you just need to follow the ihrd you know uh, index and if you follow that uh, unfortunately in last year uh, we came down by two digits uh, by two levels uh what is happening is that human resource development not happening here or there's a brain drain happening i do not know whether that was the factor in it but how can the hrd fall uh, similarly our global innovation index is going up it means there are people who are innovating and the necessity is actually driving them towards the innovation and innovation will contribute to rnd and both isro and drdo are doing a great job uh, you know we have to also follow examples if the best technology is outside our defense industry cannot actually churn out something which is third generation if they have to churn out something which is fourth generation and therefore i keep talking about that unless we guide them to 4.5 we are not going to be better than the adversary so therefore if the will is to take this industry to have its own innovation and its own production we must target to get our materials right to get the power and the electronics right start manufacturing our own chips we have to get not only the rare earth materials to our country but also look at the planetary materials you know the when you talk about isro isro is not about what it does on ground i think largely isro is something that it should be doing in the other planets to make an access to the planetary uh, materials because the chinese have landed and others you know other countries have all landed somewhere or the other they are doing great research work there a lot of r and d which is happening on the other planets and they would fly in some material there which would contribute uh, to rare earth plus rare uh, planetary materials uh, and and therefore the manufacturing has to really ramp up uh, we have to not only become just uh, you know uh, quantity manufacturers i think we need to go for quality manufacturing and our defense industry has to become export oriented if our defense products are sold best in the world then our military will automatically benefit out of it our industry cannot produce something which is third generation and expect the indian uh, armed forces to buy it i think i think this is this is where uh, we we need to go uh, thanks a lot i was tempted to continue with the session but we have already have overshot timing by about 17 minutes than what we had planned at so uh, all that i will uh, all that remains for me now is to thank you once again for a very illuminating session on non contact and non kinetic warfare and i want to tell everybody that we are going to meet again in a second session on thursday in the evening from 730 to uh, yeah, 750 or 
eight o'clock. So kindly spread the news around by a word of mouth, and definitely like this session on the Facebook. It is also being uh, broadcasted together uh, on the YouTube also. So have a look at it. Share the link with everybody because today knowledge is power. If you share positive news, positive knowledge with everybody, the uh, family will prosper, the society will prosper, and the country will prosper. Disruptive technologies has a lot of positive advantages, which we are not utilizing fully. In fact, the mobile phone that most of us carry, uh, carry is called a smartphone because somebody told me why is it called a smartphone? Because possibly it is more smarter than the owner who is using it. There are so many uh, facilities which are there in that, you know, including voice typing, including facial recognition, which we can use in day-to-day -day, uh, uh, life. I was just reminded in when one was a senior officer in the army, one used to dictate his dictation to his PA and uh, such like people. But now you don't require a PA. You can dictate it into a uh, uh, into your mobile, either in Marathi or in English or in Hindi. So that is a power of technology which has come at your, uh, you know, at the tip of your hand, you know. So we must utilize it. So because only when everybody becomes world class in using technology, the society prospers and the country prospers. So with this, uh, we will end the session. And there are some other questions which were there. There are a lot of response. People have liked the session. That is what uh, I can see on the Facebook uh, because my second computer is running and showing me what's happening on the Facebook. In the chat box, also there are people, Rajkumar Tiwari, Pushyatam Dole, Sakshi Agarwal, Rajendra Varadkar, me, Savarkar, uh, uh, um, many people. Some of the names I'm not uh, taking because uh, we are extremely short of time. They all have thanked you. So I, on behalf of everybody at the Savark Smarak, uh, thank you for this illuminating session. And I tell everybody that uh, we'll stop now, but we'll definitely meet and continue with the next part of this talk on Thursday evening at 7.30. So bye everybody and Jai Hind.